morning, everyone. This is uh, Carl Griffith from Graybar, and I'd like to welcome you to our G2 Talk webinar series uh, today. Um, before we get started, just a little bit about Graybar. Graybar is, uh, has a program that we call PowerSmart. PowerSmart has to do about energy savings and intelligence in commercial buildings, and of course, data centers uh, fall into that particular space. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, is chat with you just a few moments and give you some of the uh, features of the G2 Talk webinar so that uh, you can participate as fully as you can. Number one is, is that the first 50 people that register or, and log in, the people that are online, the first 50 people online right now uh, will get a certificate for a cup of coffee from one of the major coffee chains uh, throughout the United States. So check your email and you can uh, take that email uh, that you get from us and uh, walk to the closest main coffee store and exchange it for a cup of coffee. Uh, our event today will be archived, so if you'd like to get this presentation again or share it with your colleagues, you can do that. You go to graybar.com, click on the G2. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Carl Griffith from Graybar, and I'd like to welcome you to our G2 Talk webinar series uh, today. Um, before we get started, just a little bit about Graybar. Graybar is, uh, has a program that we call PowerSmart. PowerSmart has to do about energy savings and intelligence in commercial buildings, and uh, of course, data centers uh, fall into that particular space. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, is chat with you just a few moments and give you some of the uh, features of the G2 Talk webinar so that uh, you can participate as fully as you can. Number one is, is that the first 50 people that register or, and log in, the people that are online, the first 50 people online right now uh, will get a certificate for a cup of coffee from one of the major coffee chains uh, throughout the United States. So check your email and you can uh, take that email uh, that you get from us and uh, walk to the closest main coffee store and exchange it for a cup of coffee. Uh, our event today will be archived, so if you'd like to get this presentation again or share it with your colleagues, you can do that. You go to graybar.com, click on the G2 Talk webinar uh, logo, and there'll be an archive button there. Click on it, and all of our G2 Talk webinars are all archived up there uh, for you to uh, uh, re re view and review. Um, you can, we also have a Q&A as part of our session today. Uh, so at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A button. When you click that, a chat box will open up, and you can type your question in there. Uh, that question will be uh, recorded, and when we get to the end of the presentation, uh, we'll go over as many questions as we can until our uh, time runs out. Uh, it, it's very uh, good that we're talking about this subject of testing MPOs. And we're very fortunate to have Carolyn Carter from uh, Fluke Networks with us today. She's the fiber product manager, and the test equipment product we're going to talk about today falls underneath her area of responsibility. In previous conversations, we've talked about MPO connectors and how valuable they are in the data center, these trunk cables and this high-density uh, application for fiber that we've, uh, that's coming into the data center. We've had conversations about pinned and unpinned and A and B and all that stuff, but now we're getting to the most important part. How do we test that stuff? And Carolyn's going to give us the answer today and talk to us about testing. Uh, she's been with uh, Fluke Networks for 20 years. Uh, she's been the product manager in the fiber category for about a year and she's a graduate of UC Berkeley. And we're just very fortunate to have a subject matter expert on the fiber optic testing of MPOs uh, and trunk cables uh, with us today. So without any more hesitation, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Carolyn. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Carl, for um, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to make this presentation, which is going to be the faster way to test MPOs. So let me go ahead and start with the agenda. Um, first, we're going to talk about the standard and what we actually have to test. Um, basically, the way um, MPOs are, or I like to say, were tested um, in the past. I'm going to explain a better way. We're going to talk about things like setting references and polarity. Um, and then we're also going to show you how we actually test MPO trunks with the Fluke Networks product called Multifiber Pro. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start. 
Um, so looking at the standard, in the U.S. we're using the TIA 568-C standard, and for optical loss testing, it really um, says three different things. Tier 1 is required, and it basically says that you need to actually um, test each optical fiber link for an attenuation loss. Um, you also need to verify the length, but the length can be either through an automated optical loss test set or it can be obtained from the cable markings um, itself on the cabling. Uh, then there is also Tier 2, which is an optional test, and that would be an OTDR trace for um, attenuation and connector loss. And then third, and this is one a lot of customers are just hearing about and um, haven't been doing lately, um, is in circle flux, um, that you really need to have uh, correct launch conditions, um, and the circle flux gives you that, and it basically says that the light source meets the requirements of the standard. So those are the different things. Tier 1 is required, Tier 2 OTDR trace is optional, and launch conditions within circle flux is required. So um, next we're going to talk about how MPO trunks are, or as I like to say again, were tested with an optical loss test set. The first thing as you do anytime you use an optical loss test set, you need a set of reference. Um, so here I'm showing that you would connect the two together using a one jumper and setting a reference. So here's the actual rest of the way you would do it. Um, it's a little small. When you get the presentation, you'll be able to go through that. But everyone basically understands how to set a one jumper um, and then a three jumper reference. So instead of going through it, um, I'm just going to show you the different pictures. And it's, it's the same thing. You, you set a reference um, no matter what you do for an optical loss test set. You need to make sure you set the reference correctly because if you don't, you very well end up with negative loss and have issues then with your measurements in the future. So setting the reference is really important. If you were using it the way, and I want to, first of all, um, before I go into this slide, I want to apologize. Um, we're having some technical difficulties with the presentation, and this slide really is not presenting the way it sh it, it, um, it's showing. There should not be two sets of testers. The way this um, slide should be showing is the tester on the left should be connected to the, the fan-out cable um, and connected to the first blue connector. And then the remote, which is the second um, tester, should be on the other side. So it's going to show you how the tester is connected to a fan-out cable on an MPO, um, and it will actually walk down. So I apologize for the technical inaccuracy of this slide, but if you understand that, it will still make sense. So you take your optical loss test set, and uh, typically they only support um, a single connector like an LC or an SC connector, a single connector at a time, and you connect to it, and then you're going to start walking down all the different connections um, on the fan-out cable as you test. So let's go ahead and do that. So if you look at the first pair, we're going to test strands 01 and 02. So as, because these are duplex connectors, so as you walk down, you're going to take your test, and in this case, it does pass, as you can see, the nice pass in the middle. So you're going to do that for all the different connections on the MPO link. So the next two strands that we test will be 03 and 04, and they passed, so you're doing well. You have four strands tested so far, and they're all passing. Let's go to the next set, which are 5 and 6, and again, they pass and you can see your length, and you can see your loss measurements, so you know you're good. Keep going. Walk down that fan-out cable. Seven and eight, they pass. Nine and ten, they're looking good. They pass. Let's get to the last two, and whoops, strands 11, or actually 11 and 12, 11 passes, but strand 12 fails. So what do you do? Well, when you do it the old-fashioned way or this way, you're in trouble because if any one of the connectors fa connections fail on an MPO, you must test the entri entire trunk again. So all the ones that pass, you got to retest. And what you want to do is you want to clean. You need to clean the LC connections and the MPO connections. And again, if you have to actually unconnect from the MPO, you have to um, retest the entire trunk. So this is going to take some time. You also have to understand your polarity. You have to know which um, fiber is connected to the source and which fiber the meter is connected to. 
if there's a polarity change, then you have to make sure you understand where your references are going to go and where the polarity, how the polarity is changing. And we'll talk about polarity again in the future. The fan out jumpers, they're expensive. They're about four times um, the cost as your normal test reference cords. And just like your normal TRCs or test reference cords, they are a consumable product. So they are going to wear out. You need to make sure you keep them clean and you protect them because they are an expensive piece of test gear. So this method, because you had to walk through each and every one of the um, uh, cables or fibers, can take some time. And the last thing you want to happen is have a problem with the MPO connector and have to clean it because then you're going to have to go and retest everything. So this takes a lot of different, a lot of time, and there needs to be a better way. So that's what I want to show you: the better way to actually um, test an MPO trunk. So what you really want to do, what you really want, is you want a tester that has many sources and many power meters. Power meters, so you can test everything at one time instead of having to walk through it. So I'd like to introduce the Multifiber Pro which basically does that for you. There is a source and there's a meter. So let's talk about it. It's the, the Multifiber Pro was the first MPO tester for fiber trunk testing. It really has 12 individual light sources in it and 12 individual power meters. It may look small, but it is a very, very powerful unit. So um, it, will, um, it works really well. It is in circle flux compliant at the source. It sets references for each and every channel. If you change your polarity, it knows the polarity changes and it will change the reference for you so you don't have to be writing things down on scraps of paper and losing it. It measures the loss of each of the um, fibers on the um, MPO trunk. Um, as I said, it, um, it also measures and reports polarity and whether you have um, 12, 10, or 8 fibers in your um, uh, MPO trunk, it knows. It can automatically detect if you're using only 8 of the 12, or all 12, or 10. And then Linkware fully supports MPO results, and it has an import wizard to get the data into uh, Linkware so you can create reports and get your job done faster and paid. <clears throat> so in Q2, or um, next month in April, we're going to be introducing two additional um, uh, single mode light sources for Multifiber Pro um, will have a 1310 and a 1550 nanometer light source. Just like its original one, the 850, it will automatically um, understand and ID the, light, the wavelength that is being used, um, and it will work with your existing um, power meter. So if you already have a Multifiber Pro, you will not have to buy a new meter. It automatically understands the single mode sources, and it can handle the connections of, with the APC, APC connections, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, also, it um, is going to now automatically uh, determine um, if you're using an 8 or a 10 fiber measurement. There's absolutely no setup or configuration required it knows um, what type of configuration you're using and will automatically change for that configuration. Let me walk you through a little bit about the meter so you understand it. Um, we'll go through the meter and the source. So what I'm going to show you is just little call-outs um, and showing you the buttons. So like uh, this little button F1, it will save your record um, and changes, um, and it will let you change and move through your different um, features. Uh, the F2, again, it will change the channel or it will move through different selections. If you see 2 kilohertz um, on, then you do know that you do have a 2 kilohertz ID. Polarity, it will automatically show you what polarity um, the meter is seen in the current link, A, B, C, or other, which is the corning, and I'll explain that. Or a question mark, we can't understand the polarity, it is messed up. So we, it's not one of the standard polarities we're used to, so um, we're letting you know that. The next one, this OK button, um, it indicates whether the channel is above the user settable limit or not, so you know if you're meeting your test report or not. Uh, and then the next one is the menu selection, so it indicates the uh, measurement mode. Are you doing a power measurement, set reference, loss measurement, or are you viewing records? Continuing on with the meter, um, you can also see that this is where we're going to show you the wavelength measurement, 
is at 850, 1310, 1550. Your test limit line, which I'll explain, it makes it really simple. In the bar graph for the test limit um, or loss measurement, this is where you actually see your power loss, your power measurement or your loss value. And then this is where if you want to change the wavelength or delete records, you'd use F3. And this is where you're going to change modes from power to set reference to loss. So it is um, really simple using the different um, four keys to change different things on the meter and set it up. Taking a look at the source, this happens to be an 850 source. Um, again, F1 is where you uh, select your channel. Uh, F2 is where you go to your next channel. Uh, this is going to show you which channel you're actually measuring. So you're going to, these little dots will move from one channel to the next as it is um, actually um, um, outputting the source on that channel. So you'll know exactly what channel is, um, you're currently on as it walks through them. And then your mode or menu selection, you have choices of scanning everything or not, um, staying on an individual channel. Um, you can uh, automatically select a wavelength and the mode. So that's a kind of an overview of the functionality of the meter. Let's talk about the bar chart and how it works. Um, so there's little dots or five little bars or ovals. And this is showing you for a power measurement what your power is. So in this case, if you're only having one bar, you don't have a lot of power. More bars equal more power. So when all five of the bars are hooked up, you have the most power. If you look at the loss limit line, or in loss measurements, you're going to have a limit line. And so you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of loss. So the fewer ovals you see, that means the, low, the less loss there is. You want to be below the line. Because if you're above that line and you see the fifth um, oval, that means you have now failed the limit and you are, your loss measurement is above the limit, so you failed. So you want to be below this limit line. One, two, three, or four bars is great. Five is you have failed your limit, um, so you have a failed measurement. You need to go back and clean uh, and see what's going on. And again, that's one of the things we'll touch on in a little bit, but cleaning for an MPO trunk is very, very important. So let me tell you a little bit about the Multifiber Pro's power meter port. It's kind of special. It's not a normal power, it, it's not a normal um, power meter. It's really unique because it has um, a large contact um, area on the import. Let me explain that. So here, we just have the regular input ferrule. It has a large core fiber, so it can um, collect all the light coming in from the fiber that is connected to it. Um, so we uh, do not have any loss. It has a straight connector here for multi-mode um, fibers, um, because they uh, just will click down on this straight um, path. The, the TRC ferrule just clicks right here. Um, this is the actual fiber from the TRC coming in, and this is the long, large uh, non-contact interface. And this is really nice because that way you don't have to worry about the um, port getting um, damaged if a piece of dirt or something happens to get in here, um, and we can collect all the light that is seen. So you don't have to worry about any damage or any risk of damage to your port interface when you have a large contact um, area. And this is the way all of the Fluke Network's um, uh, power meters work. Now, this is multi-mode, though. Um, the nice, cool thing is the power meter was set up for single mode when it was built. And this is a patent-pending device or a patent-pending um, design. Um, so you can see it's the same here for the input ferrule and the large core um, fiber. However, when you put in a single mode APC connector, it is angled, and so if all you had was this flat area, it would not be able to seat in properly. But since Multifiber Pro was built to be ready for single mode APC connectors, we have an angled contact surface. So that means the connector can seat um, correctly, and you can go ahead and you're ready for single mode um, uh, measurements. So the same thing, it seats on the angled connector instead of the flat connector, 
Um, it has, again, the light from the uh, um, single mode uh, fiber from the TRC, and uh, we still have the ability to connect or c capture all the light with the large core fiber without having any worry about any worried about any loss of light. And again, um, it's non-contact, so you don't have to worry about any damage to your parameter. Uh, so, as again I said, that's pa um, patent pending design, um, but uh, Multifiber Pro, if you already have one, is ready for single mode. You do not have to go out and purchase a new meter. Let's talk about polarity. This is something uh, fairly unique with uh, Multifiber Pro. The meter knows your polarity. You don't have to worry about setting it up or not. Um, I just wanted to really give you an idea of what Multifiber Pro does for you. I'm not really expecting you to understand everything about array connector polarity. Um, I just wanted to make sure you understand how the meter works. So um, a properly configured um, MPO link will, or proper link will connect the um, network's transmitter to the receiver at the opposite end and vice versa. So a properly configured channel will always look like a type B um, polarity when it is viewed from end to end. Um, the confusing part is that the signal that you get there can take all kinds of twists and turns. So it may not always look like this, but a properly configured link is going to be um, type B or straight through. So let's take a look at some of these, uh, some of these links. There's three different types of trunks and patch cord polarities out there. Um, and so when you actually use a pre-terminated MPO cable and they're installed as permanent links, that's what is called a trunk. The first type of trunk I'm going to talk about is going to be type A. Um, and like an adapter, a type A trunk is wired as key up and key down. So you notice in my drawing, um, there's a twist. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is I'm showing you how it has to twist so it actually can hook up to um, the Multifiber Pro. Okay, so you can see that um, on this, on type A, the source channel one goes to meter channel two, or channel one, source channel two goes to meter channel two, et cetera, all the way down the line. So that's type A trunk and patch cord polarity. If we look at type B, um, you can see again it is wired as key up, key up, um, and it is straight through because um, source channel 1 goes to meter channel 12. So you can see that it's not, a, it's not straight through like this one. It is actually um, a twist. And because of that twist, I don't have to show it here because it's done inside the cabling itself. If you look at K type C, it's going to be the most complex because it is key up and key down wiring, but it also swaps individual pairs of fibers so that pair one and two are swapped, three and four are swapped, um, continue. So I'm showing you these just to get you familiar with the technology. The more you use it, the more this is going to make sense. But again, there's three types of polarity for the trunk and patch cords, A, B, and C. And the meter knows it will actually be able to figure out which one you're using, and you do not have to configure this for it when you use the Multifiber Pro. There is a fourth, I should take that back, there is a fourth, and that's what we call the universal polarity or Corning's plug and play um, polarity. Um, so this type is right now not recognized by the standard bodies, but it is widely deployed, so we wanted to make sure that um, the Multifiber Pro um, could properly report it. Right now, if you currently have a unit, um, it's going to say the polarity type is other. Uh, Corning has made a request that we change other to universal. So in the next few months, uh, Multifibers Pro display will be changed, and the other will be um, changed to universal. So whether you're using polarity A, B, C, or Corning's universal polarity, the meter will automatically know what type of polarity you're using and show you the correct polarity. You will not have to worry about understand or remembering which polarity you're currently using. So let's talk about why polarity is so important um, and with the referencing of it in the testing of polarity. It needs to be agnostic. 
Um, again, as we showed, um, MPO deployments have many possible polarities. So therefore, you need to understand the polarity and understand that the source channel 1 may be referenced by meter channel 12, or the source channel 1 may be measured by meter channel 1. Because these uh, source to meter channels may change after the referencing is done, because you've changed polarity, the meter needs to be able to transfer these references from one channel to another during a polarity change. Um, again, this is something the meter does for you, so you don't have to worry about it and keep track of where your references are, what channel they are actually assigned to. So I'm going to go through a few slides to explain this. So let's say we had polarity type B. In this case, um, the reference of 24.01 is assigned to meter 1. 24, the reference of 2402 is assigned to meter 2, and et cetera, all the way down to 12. If the polarity changes to polarity A, well, these references have to change because um, we no longer have them assigned in the same manner. So now the meter will automatically switch them for you because of the polarity change. It will move the reference of 2401 that used to be on channel 1 to channel 12 where it belongs, and it will move um, the reference 2412 that used to be assigned to channel 12 back to channel 1 as um, required. And if you continue to walk through, you'll see the meter is continuing to do this. It's going to switch all the references for you to the correct channel due to the polarity change. So when you end up, you'll see that they've all been switched. Now channel 1 goes to channel, tw or reference 2401 goes to channel 12, reference 2402 goes to 11, all the way up. So the meter automatically knows that. You don't have to keep any of this on pieces of paper and try to keep it straight. The meter understands the polarity change chain occurred, and so it will change the references and put them on the right channel for you. And the way that does that is that um, the meter has a um, encoding scheme. So it tells the, um, it tells the source, it, sell, it tells it what channel or what reference is, a chain, is assigned to what channel. And so it does that. Every time it sends out a measurement, it's telling it what reference it's using on what channel. And when the polarity changes, it will change the encoding to match the new um, uh, requirements um, and let you know now what reference is on what channel. So it does all this for you. You don't have to um, keep all these pieces of paper and keep that straight. The meter just knows. So how do we actually test an MPO link um, with Multifiber Pro? We're going to go through a couple different ways. And the first one I'm going to start with is unpinned to unpinned tr um, trunks. As I said earlier, when you use an MPO system, one of the most important things is cleaning. Um, cleaning is always important no matter what type of fiber you're using, but it is extremely important, even more important, with MPO. So the testing is uh, really simple to test an MPO trunk with Multifiber Pro, but it can get tricky if, you're if you don't keep the cleaning correct um, and uh, if care is not taken. So again, there's more than one fiber we are testing at this point. We're going to be testing 12 at a time. So there's a lot more times or a lot more opportunities for contamination. So, um, and you need to make sure you clean properly because maybe you had a piece of dirt on um, fiber one and you cleaned it and now fiber one looks good. Well, the dirt may just have moved over to fiber seven. So you need to make sure you clean and you inspect and everything is good. And so the dirt is just not moving around on your um, MPO trunk. Because again, remember, if one strand fails, the entire um, trunk will fail. So the moral of this story is basically clean, clean, and clean. Make sure you clean before every test. So to actually start with the testing, you have to prepare the meter. Um, so Multifiber Pro has a usable selectable loss limit for the pass and fail analysis. Um, so you need to set your loss as required. And remember to set a loss, you need to know um, the length of the cable and uh, the type of components you are using. So above here are the loss limits for um, the Corning um, 
um, edge O conversion model module are harnesses. So if I had a length of 100 meters, then the loss would be 1.28. That would be the limit um, that I would want to add, enter. So I'm going to enter that into the unit. And you can see I'm doing 1.30 um, because you can have a limit of um, 0 0.05. So I can't actually add an enter 1.28, so I enter 1.30. So you enter that loss limit in the unit. So you can do it per um, the manufacturer's requirement, or you can also um, enter the loss limit per application test limits. So it depends on which way you want to do it, but you do need to set a loss limit um, for uh, your measurements. And again, it's the same type of thing. Um, what application you're using, what type of fiber you're using, um, it will tell you the loss budget and the length. And so you just input that into the unit. Next, you need to set a reference. And it's no difference than any other type of um, optical loss power meter test set. Um, you just set a normal source um, meter um, reference. The only thing you have to um, now understand is you have pinned and unpinned. So this is showing how to set a reference with a, a pin cable and a pin cable, and this is a type B um, cord. So once you set a reference, you make the measurement. And so you're going to disconnect from the meter. Notice there's a little um, yellow triangle. You do not want to dis um, disconnect the test cord from the source, because if you do that, you're going to lose your reference. And that's the same no matter what type of power meter light source you're using. Do not disconnect from the source. So disconnect the meter. Insert a known good cord into the meter. Again, we're using a type B cord, and that is pinned for the trunk. And you connect to your um, link under test. And in this case, I'm, I'm going to show you all three types of links whether it's a type A, B, or C. So this is a type A. And in this case, um, the adapters are also type A. So they're key down and key up. So you connect to the, tr um, to the trunk cable. If it was a type B, it would look like this. Um, so it's a type B. And in this case, it's going to be a key up, key up. So we're using a adapter B type. And it's pinned to unpinned. If it is a type C, uh, again, it would be key down, key up. So you're going to be using um, adapter type A. And so you can see it's really simple. Um, you just have to make sure you have the correct adapter for the type of link that you are connecting to. But it's a really simple to make the measurement and do the test. Now, if you have a pin-to-pin -pin trunk, it's a little different. And the places you would have a pin-to-pin -pin trunk is when you're using some conversion modules, like the Corning Edge O, Edge AO um, conversion set. These are going to be pin-to-pin, -pin, so I have to have an unpin-to-unpin -unpin on the tester. So to do that, it's a little different. We're going to start by setting a reference. And we're going to start setting the one jumper reference just like we did before, but we're going to actually have to set a two, a two jumper reference because we have to get, um, we have to change our pinning. So to do that, again, we disconnect from the reference or from the meter after the reference is set. We add a known good cord, just like we did before. However, this time it's pinned to unpinned. So now we have unpinned here, um, and we set the reference using a um, type B. Um, and we measure it. We want to make sure the loss is acceptable, so it's less than 0.35 dB. Um, and again, you may need to clean and retest to achieve this result, um, because just a little bit of dirt can cause problems. Set the reference. In that, this case, we're setting a two-jumper reference. We disconnect. And now you notice that, in this case, one side is unpinned and the other side is pinned. Um, for this trunk, both sides need to be unpinned because it's pinned to pinned. So we're going to have to add a third cable. And this will be an unpinned to unpinned um, type B test cord. 
However, unfortunately, there's no way to verify that this jumper is good due to gender incompatibility. So when you run your test, if you find high losses, start by changing this, um, this jumper. You need to make sure you're using a known good jumper for this measurement. And then go ahead and put in your um, link under test, connect to it, and take your measurement. The last thing I'm going to go through is uh, this uh, new automated 8-fiber detection that I talked about originally. This will be coming out in um, next quarter in Q2 when we release the new version um, in the single mode sources for um, Multi-Fiber Pro. And it is automatic 8-fiber detection. Just like the polarity, the meter knows. It knows if you have an 8-fiber or a 12-fiber or a 10-fiber um, um, MPO trunk. So if you're using an 8-fiber um, trunk, then what it's going to do is it's going to show that fibers 1 through 4 are live and fibers 8 through 12 are live, but fibers 5 through 8 are going to just be empty because they're dark. There's nothing on it, so we're not going to be showing a measurement here and failing you each and every time. Um, so it's dark for the uh, corning conversion models. So there's no setup required for this. It automatically does it. And again, just like a normal measurement, it will show you the, your um, loss compared to the limit. And whether you, and if you go above the limit, it will show that you fail. So um, it's automatic detection for either 8, 10, or 12 fibers. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you for the opportunity. And uh, we're going to open up for questions at this time. Carolyn, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. It was extremely valuable. And I'm sure that our audience uh, learned an awful lot today about testing of MPOs. We have a few, several questions that come in, so we'll go over them. The first one is, is uh, you mentioned a lot of things that we need, reference cords, known good cords, adapters, and cleaning. Are, are there all of those kinds of items come in the, in the MPO Multifiber Pro? Or are those items in the kit? Um, yes, there is multiple different kits available because I don't know if you need just multi-mode or single mode. So when we release the single mode sources, there will be a lot of new kits in, um, introduced. And yes, um, the cords come with the kits, um, and there's uh, kits available with cleaning supplies already in it. So um, you'll have a selection to uh, be able to purchase what you actually need. You mentioned cleaning several times. Uh, and the importance of it. I'm, a, I'm guessing right now or assuming that maybe 80% of the time failures are because of, of, of uh, dirty connectors. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, cleaning is one of the, um, our dirt is one of the major issues with testing fibers, um, t fiber optical loss links. Um, and it's a, a, lot e a lot worse even with MPOs than it is with normal um, single connections. So make sure you clean and you clean each and every time because your link under test may be very um, may be acceptable and um, below limit, uh, and you're going to be failing due to dirt in the connectors. All right, great. For people that are online, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you type the question into the chat box, it will appear on our end and we'll lift it up, assuming we have time. There's lots of questions here, Carolyn. I hope you don't mind. Uh, the oh, first that's one, fine. Uh, there's a question here that... Uh, that came in from Matt, and he's asked a question about does this solution integrate with a uh, Versive platform to consolidate testing devices? And he makes a comment that's like what JDSU equivalent does. Can you address that if we, if we know? Um, at this point, uh, Multifiber Pro is a standalone option. Um, Versive is a platform where you can add different modules for different requirements, whether it's copper, um, optical loss, or OTDR testing, and even network troubleshooting. Um, at this point, uh, the uh, Multifiber Pro is a standalone is the solution for MPO testing from Fluke Networks. Um, there's a lot of things in that unit, and powerful, and it's already ready to go. All right, great. Mike asked a question about a reference cable, and you've already answered that in the presentation, so I'm going to move on. Uh, William wants to know how much the tester is going to cost in the kit form. Uh, William, I'll make sure that a gray bar salesperson contacts you here uh, today or tomorrow with that, so we'll address that, uh, and I'll have a gray bar person uh, contact you. Uh, Jose would like to know if you're planning on coming out with a 24-fiber MPO version. 
Um, at this point, um, we're not coming out. We don't have that plan because um, there's all kinds of different harnesses or there's different conversion modules, um, such as Corning has one that will take a 24 um, pin MPO or an MPO trunk and split it down to three eight pin um, MPO trunks. So because that is still um, being defined exactly what is needed, um, we're sticking to the um, 12 uh, um, fiber um, MPO links at this point. Um, but there's all kinds of solutions out there if you need something different. We've gone over this in previous presentations, but Charles asked the question again, so I think it's important for us. Could you just briefly describe again what, it, what the terms pinned and unpinned mean? Sure. Um, can I? Is it okay if I push back to different slides? Is that, is that Absolutely. possible? Absolutely. Just go to where you want to go and, and uh, go back to the previous slide and push it to the audience, and you can show Let's that slide see again. If I can see that. Okay. I don't know if you can see on here, but on this particular slide, it says it's pinned. That means um, think of male, female components. Um, so a pinned has connectors. Um, sticking our connectors that will actually then pin into um, an unpinned connector. And the reason those two pins are there is it's to actually um, line up the, two, the fibers in an MPO cable correctly. Um, it's, a positioning, um, it's positioning pins. Without those positioning pins, the fibers would not line up correctly. And we're talking there are 12 different fibers in an MPO trunk. You need to make sure that they are lining up properly, and that's what the pins do. So there's an unpinned version and a pinned version of um, an MPO connector. Uh, thank you for that. That's exactly right. That, that alignment is so critical. Charles, if you go back into some of our previous uh, uh, G2 Talk webinars uh, in the archive, you'll, you'll see some other uh, uh, presentations there that go into a, an immense amount of detail about pinned and unpinned, and I encourage you to go there. Or you can contact your Graybar sales representative, and we'll get you more detailed information about that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, can we go to Bryant? Can, can we go Bryant, to Bryant about yeah. saving? Yeah. With, um, yeah. What about saving or publishing the results? Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. And um, due to time, I didn't put these slides in. I apologize. But um, in, uh, Multifiber Pro is fully compatible with Linkware, which is our report management system. So you can actually then you basically just upload the results from the Multifiber Pro into Linkware. Um, and now you can publish a, um, a report however you want. The nice thing about the new version of Linkware is you can com um, combine different test results um, from different products in a report and now um, have a single report instead of having to have multiple reports, one for if you're doing copper testing, one if you're doing optical loss testing, one if you're doing MPO testing or OTDR testing. You can combine all your reports into a single pass-fail report um, for your requirements. So Linkware um, is the, basically is the industry standard when it comes to reporting and it's very simple to use. Great, thank you. Uh, Carolyn, if you don't mind, would you look at Mike's uh, question there about the Molex cable uh, and, and the strands 3 through 10 uh, for our 8 strand 40 gig? Could you look at that and see if we have a I, – I don't quite understand uh, what he's getting at there. Um, it looks like he has a different – let's go back to this guy. Um, it looks like with his cables – um, he is transmitting on eight strands, but he's transmitting on three through ten. And so he's wondering why does the power meter, um, when, we're, when we do the automatic eight fiber detection, uh, only test on one through four and nine through twelve instead of three through ten, um, such as uh, his cabling is does. Um, well, well, typically what we, what we have seen is when it's an eight fiber strand, these are the ones that one through four and nine through 12 are the ones that are live, and typically five through eight are dark. I guess I haven't seen one where only three through 10 is live. If you have a 10 strand system, that makes more sense because in a 10 strand system, then two through 11 are live and one and 12 are dark. So... I'm not sure about this one, about 3 through 10. Um, could it be 10 through 11? And that's a 10-fiber 
system, and yes, Multifiber Pro will automatically detect that and um, not fail you on dark 1 through 12, 1 and 12. Mike, the good news is, is we've recorded all these questions, and so we'll make sure that we get back to you with more detailed information. I get the feeling we, meet, we need to have a little more conversation to determine exactly what you're getting to. We're running out of time, so I'm going to take us to our last question here, uh, Carolyn, and that's from Russ. And he would like to know, uh, is there going to be a version of Linkware that comes out that's going to be compatible with a Mac? Oh, yeah, that's a good question, and sorry about that, Russ. At this point, um, we are going to be keeping on the Windows-based platform. However, um, I have a lot of people who do run Linkware on a Mac, and they basically use the emulation software um, on a Mac that allows you to run Windows programs. And we haven't had um, issues with that that I know of. So, um, But at this point, it's going to stay a Windows-based system. Great. Carolyn, again, I want to thank you for the time that you gave us today. This was a, a tremendous presentation about testing of MPOs. I want to remind everybody that's online uh, that this will be archived. You can go to graybar.com and click on the G2, G2 Talk logo.